Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What does it really mean that Jesus sent His disciples, that He sends His church, that He sends you? How much time do we actually spend considering what that really means? On a day-to-day basis, throughout the entirety of our lives, what does it really mean that Jesus has sent me out and armed me with His Word? I fear that's one of the elements of Scripture that if we've grown up in church, we hear it and just sort of take it for granted that that's the normal way of things and don't think too much about it. But it really is quite significant. Our gospel reading today highlights a key shift in the mission and ministry of Jesus. Up to this point, as I shared with the children, Jesus was doing all the work. Much like when we gather here on Sunday mornings in divine service, that name is no accident. The divine has come to serve you, to give you His gifts freely as a gift of grace, because as we learn from our reading in Romans today, He's the sort of God that dies even for sinners, even for sinners like you and me. But He also teaches and reveals through His Word to us today that He's not finished with us after He saves us, but that He calls us according to His purpose, and His purpose is to send us out so that others may come to know Him, to use us as His instruments, as His mouthpiece, to bring the promises of God to bear in the gospel, to declare as He proclaims to the disciples, the kingdom of heaven is truly at hand. Jesus, the King, is here, and He has come to save His people. Now, there's a little bit of confusion when we read our gospel reading today because some of the elements of the sending of the twelve apostles are unique to their sending here in the gospel of Matthew. I don't know about you guys, but I can't heal afflictions just by speaking. I can't raise the dead But the apostles can because Jesus gives them the authority to do so. But he doesn't stop there. This is the first fruits of the things that are to come. The beginning of the expanding and broadening of his mission so that it eventually will encompass every nation under heaven and utilize all his disciples, all those who follow him. So let's see what today applies just to the twelve apostles and what we can learn from those truths, as well as what applies to us even today. Well, as I mentioned, the context of this section in Matthew represents a shift from Jesus preaching, Jesus teaching, Jesus doing miracles, to now He's sending His disciples, and He's sending them to the lost sheep of Israel. In chapter 9 alone, before we get to the verses today, here's what Jesus does. He heals a paralytic. He calls Matthew, the very author of the book, to be his disciple. He heals a woman with a discharge of blood. He raises a girl from the dead. He uh, restores the sight of two blind men and heals a man who's unable to speak. Jesus is doing incredible things. But more incredible things are yet to come And then he begins to tell his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to God so that he will send out laborers into his harvest, and then he makes good on that prayer right away. And he gave all of this authority to his 12 disciples. He turned them into apostles by sending them out with all of his authority to continue his teaching to bring the healing and relief from the effects of sin through the healing of afflictions and diseases and the casting out of unclean spirits. In other words, Jesus is no longer going to perform His ministry alone. Let that sink in for a moment. The God of the universe who needs nothing and can do everything dies to save you, a sinner, and then enlists your aid 
in his mission to bring the Word of God to bear in the lives of all people. That's a big change. That's an incredible shift and a wondrous gift for all people. For it is through this method that everyone here in this room today and those who are watching online who have faith in Christ, it was carried out through His disciples, bringing the words of God and His gifts to bear in your life, taking up the call, answering the call that Jesus has placed in their life to bring Him to bear in what they say and do. And the very next chapter in our reading begins with exactly this mission. He sends His disciples out. The Lord of the harvest is sending the laborers into the field to begin the work. Now, some of these things, as I've mentioned, are unique to the apostles, right? He says, he says I've specifically sent you to the lost sheep of Israel, which becomes a different mission later on when He sends out the whole church. Then it's all nations. He says, go nowhere among the Gentiles or Samaria, only to the lost sheep of Israel. For they are God's chosen people, as we had read from Exodus today, His treasured possession. He wants to redeem them just the same, and so He sends His disciples to preach so that they will repent and realize the kingdom of heaven has come forth in Jesus. They have been given a special authority that is not shared by all of His disciples, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. And then he speaks specifically about some of the things they're going to face. And we know from what happens to the apostles that this turns out, of course, to be true. That they're going to be delivered over into the courts to make testimony in the presence of governors and kings, that they're going to be flogged and many of them killed, carrying out this task that they've been given by Jesus. All of that language speaks to the specific calling of the twelve apostles. So what can we learn from that if it's not really given to us to do those things? Well, there are a number of things in this section that apply to us generally. As I said, this is the sort of first fruits of this expanding of the ministry that now you and I participate in even today. The first to note is the motivation behind it. If you look in chapter 9, verse 36, the motivation is, compassion. Jesus sees a lost and harried people, and He's moved to compassion because they're like a sheep without a shepherd. That is who we are sent to, those who are harassed and lost and helpless, even if they themselves do not know it, to be moved to compassion. We're also sent, just like they were sent, not with as narrow of a mission as, as he highlights here in, in chapter 10, but with a much broader mission, but we're sent all the same. Yes, you have been enlisted by the God of the universe to bring His glory to all the nations, to share the gifts of God that have been given to you in Jesus. That is what the church is all about, and the church isn't this gathering place. It is you, the people. The truth of being sheep sent out in the midst of wolves also applies to us as well as it does to the apostles. We are not given to fight and to conquer our foes, but to stand firm in the faith and witness of Jesus and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit even in the face of persecution. In fact, the disciples go as far as to say, and Jesus teaches them, that they should rejoice in the suffering they bear for the sake of Jesus for in it they glorify God and continue to bear witness of His wondrous love. So to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves applies to us too, not seeking trouble on its own, but also not fleeing it when it comes, but standing firm in our faith. And lastly, the the speaking through. So the apostles were brought into courts before kings and governors and flogged in synagogues. And Jesus tells them, don't be anxious about in those moments what you're going to say. Which makes sense. Can you imagine being brought into the presence of a king? You didn't prepare your speech. You weren't there because you chose to be. 
it seems pretty natural to be afraid. What if I say the wrong thing? A fear that many of us still share today. And not even talking to kings, but maybe just our neighbor or a friend from work. Pastor has all those fancy theological words. What if I don't know what to say or how to answer the question? Or if I say the wrong thing and I hurt the mission of Jesus? Well, God speaking through you is true for you just as it is for the twelve apostles. One of the reasons we gather here on Sunday morning is to receive that which God wishes to give us, and one of those main things is His very words, the words of God. The reason it's so important for Christians to meditate on God's Word is so that when we go out, we can speak with it. For what we have been given, we want to give to others. They don't need our own words of wisdom or our rational arguments or our eloquence, but rather they need the words of God, the very same words which you received and by the power of the Holy Spirit created faith in you and brought about the realization of the joy of the love of God. Some of you may have uh, heard me refer to the work of a pastor in using the image of a king's messenger, that I'm a person under authority, an authority given by God. And so the words that I speak, sometimes, if you're just viewing me as them speaking from myself, may seem presumptuous. Who is this person up there that is forgiving my sins? But it isn't me. I'm just an instrument. And the words that I am called to give to you are not my own words, and not spoken from my authority, but rather God's words spoken from His. And that's what He sends you out to do just the same not to come up with something of your own, but merely to pass along His words to those who desperately need to hear them. After all, when the king's messenger shows up, and we see this with the way he treats the disciples, if somebody rejects you, they reject me because you're just the messenger. None of these ideas are your ideas. None of these words are your words. They are the king's. And you're only able to say them because He's asked you to do so and He's sent you armed with His very, His very words. And so we can do nothing else. And that can be a comfort to us when we're nervous or afraid or worried about speaking incorrectly. Turn to God's Word and rely on the words that He has given you. For they are the words of spirit and power, the very words of life in Jesus. So dear friends in Christ, Today I challenge you, I challenge you to go, not out of some sense that if you don't do that, God won't love you. He's already proven that that's not the case. He dies for sinners, not just good people. But go nonetheless, for you have been saved and called according to His purpose. He has enlisted you and called you to share the very love of God which has renewed your hearts and minds, and you have been reborn into this new life in Christ. You have been set free in your salvation to serve in this way, so that all may know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message is just the same as it was all those years ago, that God has come in the form of a man, Jesus Christ. And He saw us sinners and He was moved to compassion because we were helpless and harried and lost. And He died on the cross for sinners and made them His children, gave them new life and eternal life. So while we may not have been given authority to heal all diseases and affliction, to cast out unclean spirits or raise the dead, God has sent you Nonetheless, armed with His Word to proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ. What does that look like? Well, it begins with seeing others with compassion and asking yourself, even when they upset you, who is this person's shepherd? With the hope that it will soon be Jesus. Because we are a people called to move in mercy because we have received mercy. We are called to give without pay because we have received mercy without pay. And we have been given the greatest gifts of God in all of creation for free. So let us go from this place today with renewed hearts, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, compassionate eyes 
the eyes of faith given through the Holy Spirit, and grateful hearts seeking to proclaim the wonders of our God and the love that He cares for us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, God is with you wherever you go. He speaks through you. He has given you the words to say. Don't put pressure on yourself to come up with something new or of your own accord, for you have been given all you need. That is the good news. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is near because God has drawn near in compassion, and He has saved you through His Son, Jesus Christ, through His death on the cross and atonement for your sins and the new life of resurrection that He has given you by grace through faith. To God be the glory. Amen.